pray just Blessed Father, we are indeed happy to come before Thee tonight and to ask these favors that You would pour out of Your Spirit upon us all tonight and, and just shed abroad Thy love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we pray that You'll heal the sick and the needy and give glory to Thyself, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Let's be expecting tonight that the Lord is going to give us the night that we have looked forward to ever since we've been in the city. Amen. Just an exceeding abundantly tonight is my prayer. I wish to read tonight from St. Matthew's Gospel and the 17th chapter to those who usually take down the, the Word. I love to read the Word because... I know if no more than just the word being read, there'll be a blessing by that. My words will fail because it's the word of a man. God's word will never fail because it's the word of God. And we know that that much, if we read the scriptures each time when we come to the service, there will be a blessing because that it's God's eternal and blessed word. And after six days, Jesus taken Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make unto thee three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake these, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And I wish to take tonight for a text, them last three words, Hear ye him. We find as we read this marvelous word of God, we find that where our Lord Jesus was always about the Father's business, every step that he made had a meaning. There was not one act that he did but what was ordained of God. And it does us so good to think that the Bible said the footsteps of a righteous is ordered of the Lord. Amen. And if we'll just do what's in our heart. David was once sitting before Nathan the prophet. And he said, Is it right that I live in a house of cedar and the ark of my God under a tent? And Nathaniel said to him, Do all that's in thine heart, for God is with thee. And we find in our most unusual scripture reading tonight, a very outstanding instant. Many times, no doubt, the clergymen in the building, the pastors and evangelists, has preached to this many times. But every time that you preach anywhere in God's Word, it's something new. There's been thousands of pastors and evangelists since the day this was written has preached the same subject. And every time they preach it, there's something new. Uh, every time you read a place in God's Word... It opens up something new to you. It goes to show that it's inspired. If I wrote you a letter, you would perhaps appreciate it. Might keep it for a while. But that letter only will soon run out. It only has 
of the valuation of our friendship. And now after you're gone, then that letter would hold perhaps nothing at all. But not so with God's Word. Every generation, it's just as new and life-giving as it was the day it was written. And the real correct approach to this text tonight is the order of the second coming of Christ. How that first he saw Jesus, then Moses and Elijah, and then Jesus only. Truly that is in perfect harmony with the second coming of Christ. And he had said just previous to this that many stand here shall not see death until they see the Son of Man in his glory. And that was a prefigure of his coming in glory. But we want to take a new route on this tonight. Another way around because Every word of God dovetails together. There is no contradiction in God's word. I like to see the scripture that contradicts itself that cannot be straightened by the same scripture. It is written surely in parables because it's a purposely did that way to confuse the wise and prudent that God might reveal it to babes such as would learn. Now we find this, that God meets in the council of man sometimes, great large councils of man. We see once where he appeared before 500 brethren. Again he appeared in the presence of 70. Then in 24, or 12, 3, and even to 1. Christ will appear before any honest heart. No matter how insignificant you may seem to be, your, uh, your soul is worth 10,000 worlds. Yes, right. Some time ago down in Tennessee, I was standing at a great museum. And I was looking in a glass with some young fellows who were standing next to me. And it was showing the chemical worth of a 150-pound man. And it might surprise you to know how much you're really worth. If you're in good health, a good strong man at 150 pounds worth 84 cents. Well, you're not worth very much, are you? Just about enough whitewash to sprinkle a hen's nest a little bitty calcium and so forth all weighed up to 84 cents worth of chemicals in your body. One young fellow said to the other, he said, John, we're not worth very much, are we? I thought this was a grand opportunity. I laid my hand on each one of the boys' shoulders as a step between them. And I said, that's true, son. We're not worth very much in this body, but in that body's got a soul in it that's worth 10,000 worlds. But we want to take care of this 84 cents. We give it the best of clothes, feed it the best of foods, and put a $10 hat on it, and oh, how we love to take care of this 84 cents. But that soul, we just let it grab over any old world and anything else not noticing or paying any attention to it, drag it down to church and sleep while the preacher preaches 20 minutes and have a deacon's meeting that he preached too long. That soul is worth 10,000 worlds. But we find in this scripture that Jesus had chose three of his apostles. I just love to think on the Pneumatics of the Bible, how the threes, sevens, twelves, forties, fifties. And if you get those numbers running right, you can just place the Bible like one great picture. And three is a perfection like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and 
water, blood, and spirit, and so forth, and the three comings of Jesus, once he comes to redeem his bride, next time he comes to get his bride, the next time he comes with his bride, at the marriage supper, then we find that he taken three chosen vessels, Peter, James, and John. And in the Bible, we're taught love, hope, and charity, or faith, hope, and charity it is. Faith, hope, and charity. I want you to notice how beautiful that those three men type that, the spirits that was in those men. Peter, faith, right out, ready to tackle anything. James, hope. John, charity. Faith, hope, and charity. And it is written in the Word that three is a witness, our confirmation. The Bible said in the mouth of three witnesses. Let every word be established. Three is was a witness in the Old Testament. If there was an accusation against someone, it had to be witnessed by three. And it's also carried over into the New Testament that three is a witness. And we find that God was fixing to do something. And God, when He does anything, He always brings witness. Amen. We find at Pentecost, He said, Wait at the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high, then you shall be witnesses of Me. Preparing His witnesses. God sent witnesses. And he was taking these three great spirits with him to witness what God was fixing to do. Now, God never does anything without first confirming it, making it known. He does nothing in darkness. God's in and above board. All that he does, what you hear in the secret chamber, preach on the housetop. God don't want anything covered up. And now this might help you. And when men and women who profess to be Christians and never testify to the unsaved or let their light shine, there's something wrong with that individual. God wants you to let the light shine, give Him praise anywhere. As Paul said of old, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Right. And we find these three witnesses going up to give testimony of what God was fixing to do. Now, in the Old Testament, all the Old Testament was practically types and shadows of the new. God never asked the man to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. When God put penalty of death on the human race, there was only one just thing for God to do. If he had sent an angel, God would have been unjust. If he had sent another creature out of heaven, he would have been unjust. But the only way that God could do it was take the sinner's place himself. Therefore, he had to become flesh. And he lived in his only begotten son, tabernacle here on earth in a body, Christ Jesus, and made a little lower than the angels to suffer death. We had it in the message last night that he had to catch the stinger in death in his own flesh and pull the sting out of death. Oh, brother, sister, what a marvelous revelation. What a marvelous truth it is to know that God has tucked the sting out of death. 
Now stood in the face of dying saints, watched them raise their hands and tears rolling down their cheek and shout the victory right in the face of death. It's a beautiful sight. And we find now in the Old Testament, there's many words in our new King James Version that seems very strange. But for me, the rest of you, brethren, can teach from any version you want to, but I like the King James. This seems more like the Bible to me. And in there, there's some translations that might seem just a little bit strange to us. For instance, in John 14, it said, In my Father's house is many mansions. My father's little house has got many great big mentions in it. Now that seems strange. But the translators that was translating the Bible for King James used the language that they used in that day. And in England they had the same setup that they had in the Old Testament. Now, in England... They had what they call the Father's house was his domain, the king's domain. Now, the Moffat, I believe, translation is more ridiculous than the King James. It says, in my Father's apartment house is many apartments, like you were going up there to rent an apartment. But it's, both of them is, here's the original translation. In my Father's kingdom is many palaces. Amen. That's the way it is in the original Hebrew. Now, but in King James' time, they had to translate it so the people would understand it. Now, in the Old Testament, they had the same kind of a setup. A father owned a great lot of ground. And it was called his house or his domain. And when all over the different parts of his country, he had little homes, little tenant houses, we call them in the state. And his tenants lived in those houses. And now when a baby was born in this home to this wealthy father, well, the father being a businessman and had to be about the business, he sought all over the country until he could find the very best tutor that he could to raise this son. Now, if you will pardon the expressions, and now what you believe of this you take, and what you don't believe you just lay aside and, as I do when I'm eating cherry pie. If I run into a seed, I don't throw the pie away, I just throw the seed away. And keep on eating pie. You do likewise. Now, what God was fixing to show here on Mount Transfiguration, it was He was fixing to do just like He had them do in the Old Testament, placing of a son. Now, when a son was born into the family, he was a son at birth. And there's where you Pentecostal people jumped the fence. You thought that when you were born again, that settled it. That only was the beginning. That's right. You are a son, surely, when you're born. But when this son was born, he wasn't heir of all things yet. He had to go through the testings and trials to find out if he was the right type of son to fall heir to all things. And listen, God's Word said that every son that cometh to God must first be tried and chastened, child trained, before he can be adopted into the family. Now, this father taking the son and turned him over to a razor, a tutor, school teacher, otherwise. And this school teacher had to bring word to the father, 
just how that child was progressing. If he was slowful, or if he was dilatory, or if he was a bright, intelligent, wide-awake young man. Now, the father had to find the man the right kind of a tutor. And that's a beautiful type of the church. Amen. That when we become sons of God, born into the kingdom of God, the Father sent to us the best tutor that he could find. Amen. The Holy Spirit. Now, he never sent us an archbishop to be our tutor or general overseer or district man. That's where we've made our mistake. The church is governed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's God's government for his church. But we've adopted other tutors, other razors. And then this tutor must be just not pull any punches. He must bring the direct truth to the Father. And how that tutor must blush when he comes up to the Father in his face and said, Your son is not doing too good. He's failing in his studies. He's dilatory. How the tutor must feel to come before the father with such a message as that to about his son. And I often wonder how the Holy Spirit must feel in the presence of God, bringing the conduct of our modern day church with so much world in it, people so dilatory. Those that he's been graceful to and given the new birth. Oh, it must be terrible. And to think that in these last days how corrupt our church is getting to be. On Wednesday night, instead of going to the prayer meeting, they stay home to watch television. Remember those Conducts of yours goes right straight in the presence of God but somebody who won't pull punches. No matter how good a neighbor you are, what a fine pillar you are in the church, the Holy Spirit brings the truth to God. How he must feel when he goes and says the women, the daughters of the church, strip themselves down and wear little low short clothes and get out and lawn mow the yard before man. That might burn you up, but it ought to. It's right. What's been the matter today is too many sissies behind the pulpit and a lot of Hollywood evangelism. We need the old-fashioned gospel, the old-fashioned St. Paul's revival, and the Bible Holy Ghost back into the church again. It used to be wrong for holiness people and Methodists and the people that tried to live right, the women to wear manicure or what you call the stuff you put on your face. I know that's the wrong word, but I can't never think of it. Anyhow, it used to be wrong. But now you can't tell one from the other. It used to be wrong for the Christian women to bob their hair. Something went wrong somewhere. The Bible says it's wrong. Uh, either you got out of the harness or your pastor got out of the will of God. He quit preaching it. But that's the truth. Amen. And the Holy Spirit bears record before God. It's right. It used to be wrong for the people to go out to picture shows and entertainments of the world. But today you can't tell one from the other. People will miss prayer meeting to attend some kind of a lodge meeting. And how in the world can a Christian who calls himself 
a child of God ever go into these places to eat and so forth, these little old Nickelodeons, and play them rotten songs of Elvis Presley's and all those things that talk about being shook up? I tell you, you're going to be shook up one of these days, and that's true. But how not only the young folks, but grandma and grandpa does it. That's right. Babysitters, while mom and papa's out getting around over the country, and on Sunday morning they go to church with the long, sanctimonious face. What you need is a good old-fashioned Holy Spirit shaking is what this country needs. You know that's truth. No, oh, years ago, it used to be wrong for women to smoke cigarettes. But it's popular now. And no matter how much the medical science says is that carloads of cancer in ever package of cigarettes, I heard on the radio the other day that there'll be more people die in the United States in the next year than were killed on both sides of the war because they smoked cigarettes. Throat cancer caused by smoking cigarettes, and yet it's estimated that about 95% of the Christian church smoked cigarettes. What a disgrace you talk about a fifth colonist. That's the fifth colonist. I'm not worried about Russia coming over here and doing any harm to us. They're not going to hurt us. We're hurting ourselves. Our own moral decay is what's taking us down. It isn't the robin that picks the apple that hurts it. It's the worm at the core that hurts it. It's our own rottenness. You say, Brother Brandon, you're picking on the women. All right, you men, here you are. Any man that'll let his wife put on them dirty clothes like that little old shorts and get out before the public, it shows what you're made out of. I don't call him much of a man. That's right, you're supposed to be the head of the house, but she's the next. She tells you where to turn. It's a woman's world. That's right. And you're giving in to it. And you come out and find Christian women laying out on the beach to get a tan. Well, I got two girls here tonight. I don't know what the future holds. But if I ever catch one of them, when she's a young woman laying out on the beach to get a tan, she'll get a tanning, all right. It won't be from the sun. It'll be Charles Branham's son with a barrel sat in his hand. Bring her home. Make her jump every time. What we need today is some more old-fashioned mamas and papas. Amen. Instead of having all this old True Story magazines laying on the shelf, is to have God's Word laying there and reading it and believing it Amen. and teaching their children to be brought up in the admiration of the Lord. Amen. Amen. What do you think the Holy Spirit feels when He comes before the Father? Your daughters are wearing shorts. Your sons are permitting it. What a beautiful picture you are. But that's what it is. I'm not scolding you. I'm just trying to bring you the truth just a little along so it won't scorch you too hard. It's better to be scorched a little here and burnt hereafter. Notice, the Holy Spirit has to bring that to the Father. How the Father must say, I, I can't get those people to do anything, the Holy Spirit says to the Father, uh, we just, I, I warn them, all the things that you've sent to them, they go to church and your Spirit will just perform all kinds of things. They'll just sit and look around like a little jug, fill up pretty quick, get up and go home. What do you think God thinks about you when you do that? I hope there's a whole lot of them here. When you can't listen to the gospel 30 minutes, you're not long ago, I know, to a church. Some fellow was a great member of this church or wanted to become a member, and he had lots of money. 
And he said, I don't want to make a public confession. And that pastor took him secretly and baptized him and took him into the church. We ought to kick him off the platform. It's exactly right. He's not worthy. Here some time ago, I was going down to the river, and a woman said, we was going to baptize a group of people. And she said, Brother Branham, are you going down now to duck me? I said, woman, your heart's not right with God. I certainly will never baptize you. You go home and repent and get right with God. Certainly. Now, when the father finds the child that's obedient, how he likes to come and say, Sir, your boy is a perfect child. How obedient your children are. How they love to worship you. They gather together and they raise their hands and the tears runs down their cheeks. They're just so full of joy. How the Holy Spirit might, must love to do that. For God is an object of worship. And God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Jesus said so. But we get so starchy, we just can't make a grunt. We couldn't say amen, we, we, we just sat there. See How the Holy Spirit must... Dread to say that to the Father. But when we are obedient and love Him and praise Him and give Him glory, how the Holy Spirit must love to bring this to Him. You always say, Father, you know your Son's just like you. Oh, it's just perfect. And if we'd say it here in our street expression, just a chip off of the block. Why, He loves you. He's obedient. Now, If that boy is no good, yet he's a son, he's never nothing but a son because he's born to son. But if he is not obedient and the right kind of a son, he just continues the son on out without any reward. But if that is an obedient son, according to the scriptures, then there is an adoption of that son. Or the placing of that son. Then after he gets a certain age, he's taken out into a public place. And then there's a great ceremony made. Out before the public. And this son is set up on a high place. And there is a ceremony of adoption. Think of it now. The father adopts his own son into his family. And then after that, that son's name's just as good on the check as his dad's. It's a public ceremony, and they're all out there, and they see this father positionally place that son. And that's what's the matter with the church today. The reason that we don't have great, mighty manifestations, this great church of the living God in these last days should be far down the road with every divine gift setting order a great beautiful church. But we have broke up into denominations and isms and little fusses and everything so God can do no more with us until we come together. And get our hearts right with God. That's why our blessings are about run out. That's why the churches is getting cold and cooling off. Is because we've been indifferent towards God, His Spirit, and His Word. It's true. We never welcome the Holy Spirit no more. What if the king would come, the queen would come over here and visit Edmonton? All the flags would go up. And they lay out the welcome carpet. The little girls and maidens would stand on the street to welcome the lovely queen when she got off the train. Down through the streets, they would, she would go. She'd have the best the city's got. The ladies would stand and throw rosebuds and different welcomings to her. That's what she should do. But she's just the queen, just the woman. And then Jesus can come to a city 
And they'll say, holy roller, fanatic, take them out. We don't want this. It's against our denomination. Oh, God, have mercy on his stupid children. When Jesus Christ will manifest himself in the midst of the people to show his resurrected power. And those who are supposed to be his children will shake their heads and say, that's nonsense. It just so happened that way. It, oh, I don't know, that's telepathy. How the Holy Spirit must feel in the presence of God with such a message as that to take to him. No wonder we don't get nowhere. Everybody's wanting to pack the ball. When a correct football game is going on, they'll pass the ball to their best man. But today, every man, bless God, I can take her myself. And that's the reason we are floored. We never have a touchdown. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, and all together, we are in this great fight of life. We are to stand behind our pastors, stand behind our brethren with all that we got within us. And instead of that, you say, well, he's a simile. He's a Methodist. We won't have no fellowship with him. We never cooperate in that meeting. No, sir, we won't have nothing to do into it. Oh, you poor, deluded, decrepit people. Shame on you. What do you think the Holy Spirit says in the presence of God? There is not no division in the church of the living God. Amen. Amen. I'm 48 years old. I never was invited to join the Branham family. Why? I was born in the Branham family. I become a Branham by birth. That's the way we become a child of God. It's not by Methodist, Presbyterian, or Anglian, or Pentecostal, Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness. We are born by the Spirit of God into the church of the living God. Certainly is. And then our character is watched by the Holy Spirit. And if we are Methodists today and they make us a little mad and we go over to the Baptists the next day and they fuss at us a little bit and something preacher says something steps on your toe, then away you go down to the Pilgrim Holiness or Nazarenes or somewhere like that. No wonder. You pack your paper from place to place till it's about tore up. Why don't you take your name off of it anyhow and put it on the Lamb's Book of Life? Let God take care of it. Fellowship with all the brethren of like precious faith. Whether you see eye to eye like, that doesn't matter. We're at least Christians, brethren, born in the same family. God received us in our peculiarities. We should receive each other. Then, if then this son is found to be a, a good son, a trustworthy son, one that the Father can put confidence in, then all that the Father has, he falls heir to it all. And God was showing in this great illustration as he took Peter, James, and John up to the top of the mountain in a high place, brought them apart from the rest of the world. He was going to show what he was going to do. And there, before witnesses, three of the earth, three of heaven, there was Peter, James, John of the earth. There was Moses, Elijah, and Jesus of heaven. God was going to make this so official that the heavens knew it and the earth knew it. And then he took Jesus out to one side and he overshadowed him with the glory of his presence. And they looked up and they said, His garments shine like the light. Did you notice in the Old Testament the sun was put on a special robe for this adopting ceremony? And God put on Jesus a special robe. He glorified him right there in the presence of the witnesses of heaven and the witnesses of earth. Glorified him. And you know, Peter, as usual, like men get excited when the supernatural's done. 
And let me drop a thought right here, if you'll excuse me for a moment. When the supernatural is done, what did I say the last time I was here? There's always a mixed multitude goes with it. When Moses was down in Egypt, the supernatural was done, a mixed multitude got into it. There was believers, unbelievers, and make-believers. And they was the one who polluted the camp. Out of that come Korah. Korah was swallowed up with the earth. And when the supernatural is done, always the mixed multitude goes with it. Man get excited. We don't come to God under excitement. We come to God sanely, believingly, honorable, saying, I am guilty, O God, and thou art righteous. Forgive me of my sins, and I'll serve thee as long as I live. That's the way you come to him, meaning it from your heart. Now notice, as soon as this supernatural began to take place, Peter, like any other man, got all excited. He said, Lord, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let us make here three tabernacles. We'll make one for all those who believe in the law, for under Moses, and they can all worship the law. We'll have another who believe the prophets, and one who believe you. See, he wanted to divide and make denominations right quick. That's just in man to do that. But he had no more than got it from his lips until a voice screamed from heaven and said, This is my beloved son, hear ye him. I'm so glad that he said that. How would you try to keep the law? No man is justified by the law. No flesh can be saved by the law. The law had no salvation. The law was a prison house. The law come and told you you was a sinner and put you in jail. But it had no power to bring you out. So I wouldn't want to be a prisoner. And that's what the law does. Shuts you up. Condemns you. And said, thou shalt not. And if you do it, you're in prison. There's no way of getting out. So I wouldn't want the law. But Peter wanted to build a denomination and call it the law worshippers. Let's build a tabernacle for Moses. And then let's look on the other side. And he said, let's build one for Elijah. What did Elijah represent? The justice of God. And we do not want justice. I don't want justice. I want mercy. Not justice. Elijah was that stern line of God's justice. God gave him a commission. He goes up on the mountain, and the king sent for him. He would not come. He had a commission from God to sit there. And the king said, that old fanatic, we'll just go bring him down. And he sent fifty soldiers and a captain. And when he came into the presence of Elijah, Elijah raised up and said, if I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. And the fire come down, justice, wipe the fifty out. Well, the king said, you know, of course, the days of miracles is past. That was just a lightning that happened to strike that group of men. So I'll just send up another group. And he sends up another group. And when they come in the presence of this old prophet, he raised up under the power of justice, And he said, if I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. And another fifty went out. God knows we don't want justice. We want mercy. Always mercy. Now, let's turn our heads the other way. Peter was trying to tell us about this. But there was a voice from heaven come. Let your denominations go. What did he say? This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. What did he represent? God's love. That's what I want. Not justice, not judgment, not law. I want God's love and mercy on me. This is my beloved son. 
Hear ye him. I'm so glad of that. For what Moses could not do, what Elijah could not do, Jesus could produce. God wanted to bless his children and he couldn't do it out of the law. Neither could he under judgment and justice. But the only way he could do it was under the love of his son, Christ Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. What is it? All the law is finished. All the judgments is finished. This is my beloved son. Hear him. All those other things are done. This is him. Today we want to hear everything else but him. You want to hear rock and roll. You want to hear all these other things. But you don't want to hear him. That's what God said. Hear ye him. Now I say to this group of people in this arena tonight. Hear ye him. And he said, except the man be born again, he will in no wise enter into the kingdom. Hear ye him. He's the great physician. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Hear ye him. If the doctor says you got a cancer and you're going to die, the man's honest. That's all he knows about it. All of his medical sciences prove that it cannot be cured. They haven't got nothing to cure it with. But hear ye him. He said, I'm the Lord who heals all your diseases. If you're guilty and you sin and you trust fast against God's commandments and you don't know what to do about it, the Bible said, hear ye him. For he took all of our iniquity. He took all of our trespasses away. Hear ye him. What we need tonight is not so much law and not so much of the, these denominations and so many barriers. What we need is the love of God. What we need tonight is men and women who will take a bold stand from the depths of their heart and serve the Lord Jesus. The world's looking today not for a new denomination. If I'd have started ten years ago when I was in here, I'd have probably been the father over a great denomination. Sure it would have been. When men come to my house and said, Brother Branham, oh, you got it in your hand, do this. No. There was somebody who spoke to me above, and I heard him. I don't want to start denominations. we got enough. What I want to do is to be a servant of him, love him and obey him, and serve him well. The Bible said you're the salt of the earth. Today you can call yourself a Presbyterian. That don't mean a thing in the presence of God. You can call yourself a Pentecostal. That doesn't mean a thing in the presence of God. What he wants to see is a man or a woman that's a Christian in their heart. That's what the world wants to see. The world wants to see men and women who are just exactly what they're supposed to be. What you profess to be. If I wasn't for Christ tonight, I'd be standing here against him. But I know he's real and I love him. And that's why I'm here for him. No doubt someday we'll seal my testimony with my blood. But I'm be happy at that day. For I know that he's the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that he cannot fail. I know he's love. Here some time ago when I lost my family and everything, someone met me and said, Brother Branham, did you keep your religion during that time? I said, no, brother, it kept me. He said, what do you think of Christ now? There's your wife and your baby laying here in a grave molding. There's your daddy and your brother laying here all in a few days apart. What do you think about him now? I said, he's more than life to me. I love him with all that's within me. Hardest hour I ever struck in my life. Just giving you a personal testimony. When I went into the room of my dying baby, there had been a gospel preacher for about six years. I stood there with my baby. They wouldn't let me go out in. They didn't want me to go in, but I slipped in. It's down in the basement in an isolated ward. Flies had gotten his little eyes. I shooed the flies out and put a little net like over it. I looked at the little thing and I said, Sharon, 
Do you know your daddy? And she suffered so hard to her little baby blue eyes had crossed. My heart was gripped. Her mother was laying in the morgue the night before. I got down on my knees and I said, Heavenly Father, what have I done to deserve this? Will you spare my baby? Oh, blessed Lord, please do. And look like come a black sheet unfolding like that. Just shut her off from my view. He absolutely refused to hear my prayer. I stood up and looked at her like that. I knew she was gone. Satan come to me. And he said, will you serve him now? There's your wife. Your father's just left. Your brother was killed up down the road. There's your wife in the morgue. Oh, yes, you're a preacher. He ought to be kind to you, shouldn't he? Will you serve him? That was the most cruelest temptation I ever had. For there was my baby. And what had I done? Nothing, as I know of. I said, reveal it to me, God. I'll make it right. But every son that cometh to God must be chastened and tried. Then all of a sudden, I was left alone to make my decision. I put my hand over her little head. I said, Sherry, honey, the angels are coming to take you home. Daddy will pack your little body down your little head in the arms of Mama. And I'll bury you out here on the graveyard hill, but some glorious day, Daddy will see you again. I raised my hand to him. I said, Lord, if you slay me, yet I'll trust you. I love you. And a great peace comes settling down over me. I remember going out to the graveyard there, and an old dove sitting up in the bush cooing. Seemed like that wind had come down through them pines there singing, There's a land beyond the river that we call the sweet forever. We only reach that shore by faith degree. One by one we gain the portal there to dwell with the immortal. Someday they'll ring those golden bells for you and me. Not long ago, my boy and I went out to the grave to take some flowers at Easter. And it was about just to break a day. The little fellow was packing a pot of flowers to put on mama's and sister's grave. I took off my hat as I walked down. I seen him take off his little hat and start snubbing. I took the flower from him and set him the flower down about where the little baby was laying. I put my arm around him. I said, Billy, honey, mama and little sister are not laying there. You see that morning star hanging down there? Way across the sea, yonder, in the lands of Jerusalem, there's an empty tomb this morning. Our Lord rose again, and they died in Christ. And those that are in Christ will God bring with him at his coming. Hallelujah. Oh, brother, genuine love can take its everlasting stand right on the rock. And the waves of death is dashing beneath it. And look a far away to him, it said, I'm the resurrection in life. Say to God, Hallelujah. certainly there will nothing will ever surpass the love of God. Certainly not. Hear ye him, the only one who can produce real love to you. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Blessed Lord, as my heart feels to think of times gone by, if it would only just be loyal to a denomination, I'd have been gone long ago. I'm so glad that one day I felt your loving arms go around my poor sinful shoulders when I was chuckling and crying and tell you how mean I was. There, sitting on a pair of wheel spurs, you give to me your love. Something went down in my poor Irish heart that's never left me since that day. Oh, God, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Your love and grace has brought me safe thus far, and it will take me on. Oh, some glorious morning, the sun will fail to come up. She'll move around out on the west and turn bloody. The stars will refuse to shine. The moon will fade out of the picture. That's the hour, Lord. I want to see when them dead begin to come from the grave to be caught up in the air. I want to be numbered among them. God, if I have to lose every friend I got on earth and everything else, 
I want to be right on that day. Dear Father, I pray that I'm here as I promised my dying companion I'd stay on the field until you come. I pray that you'll help me tonight, that you'll give me some sort of a word, some way, that'll touch down deep into the hearts of people and cause them to receive thy beloved Son and really be born again, not in a denomination, not in some kind of an ism, but truly with genuine Christian love that never fails. May they hear the Son of God say, This is me, and I come to welcome you to a life of love and freedom. Granted, Father, we ask it in His name, and while we have our heads bowed, I wonder over the audience tonight if there would be someone here that would feel deep down in their heart. Say, Brother Branham, truly from the depths of my soul, I know I haven't got that kind of keeping love. Only one man in the world could ever bring it back to its place again. It's not here. You be loyal to your nation. But brother, above all, that I know that I've passed from death to life, I raise my hands and say, be merciful, God. Now, Heavenly Father, Thou didst see the hands of these men and women, literally dozens of them, and they're sincere. The Holy Spirit's just begin moving in the meeting. We can see them as they look, wonder, God speaking at their heart. You said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. All the Father has given me will come. None of them will be lost. I'll raise them up to the last days. I'll give them everlasting life, imperishable life. Oh, God, I pray for each one that raised their hands. And many in here who did not raise their hands and should have, I pray for them likewise, Lord. May this be the greatest challenge and hour of their life, to accept life instead of death. Granted, Father, as music sweetly playing, Savior, hear my humble cry. Granted, Lord, that many just now will make that everlasting decision and say yes to Christ. And may in the stillness of their soul come that love coming down from heaven, that peace that passes all understanding, it changes darkness unto light. Death unto life. May it happen just now all over this building. While we ask that in Jesus' name, thy Son, committing them to thee, amen.
That's right. Just keep the music going. Let's just bathe in this atmosphere. Oh, it's so seldom you ever get this. I'm just an old-fashioned Christian. I believe in that sweetness of the Spirit. I just... I hope you don't class me a fanatic. I don't mean to be. But I just feel, just like in my soul, that I just like to burst out and cry or something. Just something sweeping into my life. Oh, what relaxing it is. It's like coming up to the big old oak tree and setting down in a hot day. Feeling the cool breeze as it bathes back and forth. Jesus Christ is present. Can you tonight, Christian friend, can you just draw up your conceptions just for a moment? Let's think of this. You believe this Bible to be God's eternal word? Sure you do. Well, it is. God just is real. He's just as real as, as you're. He's more real than you are. Because after all, you're just a shadow. You long for everlasting life, don't you? Sure you do. You people that's my age and older, you long to get back young again. I'm going to preach on that in a night or two. I can prove it by the Bible. You're on your road back. Yes, sir. What is it? What makes you long that this is a shadow? If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting for us. We go into that useful place to never, never be old again. How beautiful. That's what makes us call the deep, call into the deep. There's something there that makes us long. And what is it? It's that body waiting there. We groan here to be clothed upon. If I can shake your hand and you'll never be old. You'll never sit in a wheelchair, Brother Dawson. Well, you'll never be blind, my brother. Where life will be real, where life is life. How could we turn such an invitation down? Think that someday, someday, we're going to snap back and go to be with Him. I I know that's true. Christ is here. He's raised from the dead. I don't think we have time yet to call a big prayer line. I'm just going to pray for you from here. I want every one of you to be willing. Here a few days ago, a woman ran up to me and she said, Mr. Branham, she said, my mother's right out here. She's sick. It was hundreds and hundreds of people congregated. I said, I couldn't get to her sister like that. I couldn't get through the mom. Take my handkerchief here. Go lay it on her. And she bawled me out for not going. No wonder her mother didn't get healed. You can't do it like that. See, it is nothing that I've got to give you. It's something that God already has given you. you just got to receive it. I'm just a testimony of His. I'm a testimony of His resurrection. Yes. He's here. The only thing you have to have is faith to believe it. Now, if the Lord Jesus has raised from the dead, and in his audiences he stood, when you couldn't look upon the audience and they would touch him by the feeling of their infirmities, he would turn and say, Who touched me? He look around over the audience till he found who it was. Tell him what had happened. He knowed where a man was under a tree. He knowed a man's name. They come to him. Know his daddy's name. Know his Christian name. And if Christ is raised from the dead, the Bible said he's the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Now listen to me just a moment. Christ is in this building now. Christ is in you just now. You believers. Christ was in Joseph. Did you see how it made him act? Christ was in Elijah. Christ was in David. Look at David rejected, dethroned with his own people. Rejected his king in Jerusalem. Went up the Mount of Olives and looked back weeping. Eight hundred years the son of David sat on the same mountain rejected and wept. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how awful I have gathered you. 
See? It's Christ. Now, if it's Christ in you, Christ will recognize Christ. My sheep know my voice. A stranger they will not follow. Now, if God knows that I know none of you here, there's not a person outside of my dear brother Dawson sitting here that I know in this building uh, in front of me. But Christ knows you all. And if he's the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, if he will confirm that, and he said, the things that I do shall you also. He proved it, and the Jews believed him. The real Jew, the church didn't believe him. They never did, they never will, they don't yet. The so-called church, the ecclesiastical system, they never believed him. They don't yet, and they never will. Now that's awful, you say, Brother Bram, you're so rude. No, I'm not, brother, sister, dear. I'm telling the truth. If you only know the price that I paid, my brethren, to stand here tonight, I could tell you something that would shock you. Just because of the truth and the gospel that I stood clearly for, you don't know what it's cost. Certainly you don't. To maintain favor in the presence of God is to be honest with God and to be honest with you. And if I won't be honest with you, I will not be honest with God. If I can't be honest with my brethren who I do see, how can I be honest with God who we can't see? It seemed to me last night when I was standing here, that angel made a move right in this corner here, and I looked at that little yellow sacred glow hanging there in the corner. It seemed to me that spiritual people would have, should have been over. And then I didn't think that I would say what I did, and all of a sudden, a cruel rebuke came. Hundreds swarmed down. See? Tonight, the, there's a different feeling in the building. Why well, should have been that way at the first place? We're ready. We just believe God now. Now, right, let's put God to a challenge. How many in here that, especially some that I can see, when the anointing gets a little deeper? Now look, no matter how much of a gift God has given me, if you don't believe that gift, it'll never do one speck of good. When Jesus himself was the fullness of the Godhead bodily in him, he came to a city and he said, Now who is this anyhow? And that's a carpenter's son. Why, well, he never went to school around here. He has no education to speak of. Where did he get this learning at? What school did he go to? We know nothing about him. And they were offended at him in many mighty works he could not do. But when they believed him, when he performed a miracle on Philip and told him, or Nathaniel and told him where he was at, performed the miracle on the woman at the well and told her where her trouble was, she said, we know the Messiah will do that when he comes, but who are you? He said, I'm he. My, she went in, now he never went into the city and done any miracles because he knew he left that for Philip to do after he left, but he sold the word. And Philip come down and had the miracles in, in Samaria. Now Christ is raised from the dead. He's here. Now everyone look this way. And if Christ by three witnesses in this building tonight will prove that he's alive, now how is it? We are the branches. He is the vine. How many know John 15 teaches that? Jesus said, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. Now the vine does not bear fruit, does it? No, sir. The branches bear fruit. The vine only energizes the branches. Well, now, we're the branches. That's God's Word. Now, don't look and say, Brother Branham this or John this or so-and-so. Jesus is the one you're looking to. He's the life of the vine. He's the life of the branch. And the same life that's in the vine will be in the branch, and it'll produce the same life that's in the vine, if it's truly a, a, a branch. Now, if we're the branches, Christ will appear. Now, could I save you? No, sir. You that held your hand a while ago, it's impossible for me to do that. You've been saved ever since Jesus died. Could I heal you? If I had healing power, my brother wouldn't sit in that chair another five minutes. No, sir. I've watched each night over that man. I know him. I love him. See? I prayed and earnestly. I just got a letter here in my pocket from a secretary. He said, be sure to see Brother Dawson. I called him. I said, he's sitting right before me each night. I'm watching if I had one speck of healing power, he wouldn't sit there like that. Another rest of you would. I haven't got it and nobody else has got it. It's, it's yours. 
It's the purchase of Jesus Christ 1900 years ago that he died for you and he was wounded for your transgressions. With his stripe you were healed. Now the first thing is preach it out of the word. Then the next thing is working in gifts and signs. I was raised from the dead. And three is a witness as we preach tonight. If he will take three people from somewhere in this audience... And will confirm the same message that he had when he was here on earth in the same sign of the Messiahship. Would you go home tonight on your road saying, Did not our hearts burn within us? As, as those who came from Emmaus, Theophius and his friend, they walked with him all day, no doubt you've done for years. But one time he got them inside and he'd done a miracle just like he did it before his crucifixion that proved that he was the living Jesus. If he'll do the same thing tonight... We should go home saying our hearts are burning within us. Truly, he's raised from the dead. All things are mine through Christ. Now, be real reverent. Anywhere in the building, no matter where you are, look this way and pray and say, Lord Jesus, I'm not approaching Brother Branham. I'm approaching you. I'm sick and needy. And if you just have something said to me tonight, or if you're not sick, Say, I know so-and-so down there, they're sick. Have the Lord Jesus, you speak to, if we are your vine, if you're, if we are your branches, you speak through Brother Branham tonight and confirm it to this person. I'll believe you. I'll never doubt no more. That's, that's just putting him to a test. He said, prove me, saith the Lord. Now, that's a great thing. Oh, brother, we have a lot of impersonation. I realize that. A lot of it's bogus. We realize that. But that don't make the real one bogus. We got a real Lord Jesus. A real Son of God. And He works in powers and wonders. And if, do you realize what? I'm direct or indirect in contact of better than 10 million people around the world. People lay right on to your words. And then at the judgment, I have to answer for that word. I have to be careful what you're saying. I come here to Edmonton because I felt led to come here to Edmonton. And I'm here. It's up to God to do the rest. It's up to you to believe it. God, give us three tonight, please. I just feel this forsaken just at the time. Now just be reverent. Do you remember in the Bible how it said, each set still and something be revealed? It said, if you all speak with tongues, won't, won't somebody come in and say, you're all crazy? If you all speak with tongues? But said, if one prophesies and reveals the secret of the heart, then they'll fall down and say, truly, God's with you. Is that right? Sure. He's God of all gifts. Now, in Jesus Christ's name, I take every spirit under the control of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. The picture that you see and the light on it, at the judgment bar, I'll stand as a witness for this night. It isn't two foot from where I'm standing right now. I'll be reverent. This is the worship. You heard the message. This is worship. Please understand it. This is when you pour out the adoration of your heart to Christ in love. I see a lady keeps coming before me. Here. Right here. You got spinal trouble. Something's wrong in your spine. And you're praying for somebody. It's a woman. It's your mother. It's a mental condition. That's true. I've never seen you in my life. And Mrs. Hurd, if you'll believe with all your heart, you can find it the way you believe. That's your name, isn't it? Raise up your hand if that's your name. You kept nodding your head, lady. There. You thought it was coming to you, but the light was over the lady. You look at me just a minute. Do you believe me to be God's servant? you believe the second lady there? 
You believe me to be God's servant, I'll just single out one and talk. Do you think that I'd stand here and tell you something wrong? You don't. Well, if you have a need of anything, you, you just ask God. And you just, just believe. While, I, while you're sitting so close and the, the angel was standing by the side of the woman. Now, you just believe. And as I talk to you like Jesus did to the woman, probably that distance away till he found out what her trouble was. And if God in heaven, the first thing, are we strangers to each other? The, the second lady there, uh, we're strangers to each other? You. Raise up your hand if we're strangers. All right. I see the lady is suffering with a stomach trouble. She has a stomach trouble. That's the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the same God that revealed to the woman at the well where her trouble was has revealed where your trouble is. And here's something else. I see you got trouble in your back, too. That is right. That is exactly right. And you're praying for somebody, and that is your husband. And he's not here. I can see him, too, now. And if God will reveal to me what your husband is wrong with him, will you accept his healing, too? It's a rash. That's right. Raise up your hand. Now, you want me to tell you what your name is? You're Mrs. Wilson. That's right. All right. Now, just believe with all your heart. You can have what you ask for. What about the next lady? Do you believe me to be God's prophet? What do you think about this? you believe it to be the truth? I don't mean, excuse me for, well, I don't mean excuse me. That word prophet stumbles the people. I, I say servant. While you're suffering with a spinal trouble. That's exactly right. If that's right, raise up your hand. Are we strange to each other? Wave your hand like this. What if I told you he's over it now? He believed it. And it happens to be this other little lady sitting there next to her, praying. What do you think about this lady? Little lady with the white dress. You believe me to be God's prophet? Or servant? If God will reveal to me what your trouble is, will you believe it? In the first place, you're real nervous. And another thing, you have spine trouble too. It's exactly right. That's thus saith the Lord. That's right. Raise up your hand. All right, you can go home and be well. There's about four or five in a row. I see a lady right over the back of your head just praying as hard as she can. She's got her hand up like this, an aged woman, about middle age. What do you think about this, sister? Do you, yes, you there, looking right straight over the top of the lady's head. You believe with all your heart? You believe me to be God's servant? The reason I say that is this. He said if you get the people to believe you. Not believe me as him, believe that he sent me. If God will speak to me what's on your heart or something that I know nothing about, Will you believe with all your heart? If we are totally strangers to each other, raise up your hand so the people can see. All right? Look this way now. And my audience could only see that settling to the woman. Now the first thing, she's, she's wanting prayer for something that's her eyes. She's losing her sight. That's right. If that's right, raise your hand. That's what you wanted prayer for, is that right? You still believe me to be the servant of God? You believe that's true? You got glasses on. Let's look for something else. You just look right here to me again. You're wearing glasses. People say, sure. The man could see she had glasses on. Well, look this way. May God of heaven help us. God knows it's for his glory. Yes. Here it is. You've got a burden on your heart. And that burden on your heart is, I see, one, two, three, four. Four boys. And those boys are backslid. And you're praying for their soul. And that's your little girl sitting next to you. And that child has her head down praying. And right now, that little girl is a praying for a sister-in-law that's backslid. Unsaved. Is that right, honey? Little girl, raise up your hand if that's right, sweetheart. All right, go find it. God will give you just exactly what you've asked for. Do you believe? Amen. If 
thou canst believe, all things are possible. But he can only do it as you believe it. It's got to be your belief, your faith. Here, I just see the light over a young man standing here with a handkerchief in his hand. Right back over here. You, son. Yeah. You believe God Almighty has sent his son Christ Jesus and he died? He promised the things that he did. We do also. Do you believe he sent me to take his place to talk to you? All right. If he will reveal to me like he did to the woman at the well or to Nathaniel who came, you, will you accept it then? All your life you suffer with nervousness and you're a nervous person. You have all kinds of scruples and things and everything. You've crossed bridges before you get to it and all, always upset about everything. Isn't that right? I see even as a little boy when in school, you still got a little friction, things that upset you all the time, just continually upset. Is that right, isn't it? If that's right, raise up your hand and wave your handkerchief there. All right? It's finished. You can go home and be well. He who knew what you was when you was a child surely knows what the future will be. You go home, be just as happy as you can be. Rejoice and be glad. There's a little woman sitting right behind him with her hand up to her mouth. She's praying. Do you believe me to be God's servant, lady? Will, if God will reveal to me what you're praying about, will you accept Jesus as to provide what you have? Are we strangers to each other? Raise your hand. If you know. All right, you got heart trouble. And you, if that's right, raise your hand. It's a fluttering in your heart. And you have it mostly after you eat and lay down. The kinds of smothering around your heart sometimes. You get flutters, upset. It's a nervous condition in your heart that does that. you got a nervous heart. Now, do you believe that Christ heals you? If you do, raise your hand up. Now, go home and be well then in the name of the Lord Jesus. I challenge any faith in here to look and believe it. It's, Jesus Christ is, is not mythical. He's here. Don't you want him? Don't you love him? Don't you believe that man sitting right back over there with prostrate trouble? Kind of a shadow over his head sitting right back there. Do you believe, sir, at this time? You can have your healing if you'll accept it. Praying for it, get up at nights, go to the bathroom, you know what I'm speaking of. If you'll accept it with all your heart, you can have what you ask for. All right. Who else wants to be healed? Who wants to be healed? Just raise your hand. Let's keep your hands up. Merciful Father, while this magnificent presence of the Lord, I thought, surely, Lord, you would do it if these sinners come to you, if they would just wring their heart instead of their hands, not be nervous and upset, but just wring their heart before God and say, God, I believe you. Take all, all fear and doubt away from me. I pray, God, that you will heal every one of them. All the way through the building, may every person be healed tonight. Let your Holy Spirit come just now and sweep over this audience and heal every person that's sick. I have plainly told them, Lord, that I could not heal or no other man, that you've already did this for them. And you're here alive tonight in the building proving it to us that you're Jesus Christ, God's Son, and you love your people and trying to get them to return to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I pray, Father, that you'll grant it tonight and may faith anchor in every heart sufficiently for their healing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What do you think? Do you believe him? Now, you who raised your hand just a few minutes ago, would you walk up here just a minute? Sinners and so forth, I'd like to pray with you right here. Walk up here. That's good, my brother. Come right up here. I want to shake your hand. Come here. We can in this generation seeks for miracles. But do you believe God will give sight to this little blind boy? A jackknife stabbed his eyes and put him out. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I turn. Don't no one in Jesus Christ's name, don't you raise your head till you hear my voice say so. I've called two prayer lines, never got nothing in it that could show a miracle. 
I just want you, I believe, I don't know whether God will do it or not. I'm only asking him to. But I want you to know that Jesus don't only know the hearts of man, he heals man. I want every eye bowed, every head bowed, every heart bowed. Do not raise your head. I know you think sometimes, what are you doing, Brother Branham? I'm doing the same thing that Jesus did when he put him out of the house, when he healed Jairus' daughter. The father of this little boy standing here, right present. The little fellow accepted Christ a few moments ago and walked up and shut my hands. I see him stagger against the side. I said, is he blind? He said, yes. I asked the man brought him. He said, his father will tell you. He come there and he put his eyes out with a jackknife. Now, this is just a little boy who can't exercise much faith for himself. The sight has been stabbed out. What if this is your son? I don't know. Uh, God may not do it. But I trust that he will so that these people of Edmonton will find out that I'm not telling them anything wrong. Now, Sonny, I want you to just lay your head right over on me like this. Will you be a good boy now since you sir, uh, come to the Lord Jesus? Will you go to Sunday school and worship him if God will give you your sight so he can go around again? You will? You haven't got a Sunday school to go to. Shame on the, this country. You've got a Jesus that'll come to you, honey. Let's bow. Now, Lord, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift. This lovely little lad, he struck my heart when I seen him bump up against the place down there. He's blind. Oh, God, this poor little boy. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let him stay this way, God. You alone can make the blind to see. Yes, you can. Four years now. Give to him his sight, dear God. I come to Edmonton just at your will, believing that you sent me here. Oh, God, hear the prayer of your servant in this church as we pray now. And if we found grace in your sight, we pray that you'll give us this miracle tonight. And if we are wrong and ask it, forgive us, Lord. We don't mean to be. We don't seek for miracles. Because you said a weak and adulterous generation seeks after such, and the miracle to be given will be the resurrection. And we've seen that miracle night after night. But Lord, you was the one who touched the man's eyes, and he could see. You said when the blind spirit left his eyes, the deaf spirit left his ears, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll make these eyes that stabbed out, that somehow the great creator of heavens and earth will perform a miracle here. Your word is at stake, Lord. And I pray that if we found grace in your sight, that you'll restore sight to the eyes of this little blind boy. In the name of Jesus, God's Son, I ask this blessing to happen now for the glory of God. Every head bowed. No one look pleased. Do you hear me say so? Now, Sonny, I want you to ra- keep your eyelids closed. Raise your head. Now, I want you to look at me. Can you see me? Can you see my finger? See my hand? Do I have, what, I, do I have a finger up? Can you touch my nose? Can you see my nose? See if you can touch my nose. Raise your finger. There you are. Look up here and see if that... What does that look like? A light? Can you count them? Now, 
Now you raise your head. Sights come to the little boy's eyes. Point for them lights, honey. Show them what you can see them lights. Point around here. Show them all these over here. Over on this other side and up this way. Amen. Now watch here. Show them you touch my nose here. Show them. Reach over here and touch me. Let's say praise be to God. Now, Father, take him home. At the end of this meeting, if you're at the end of the meeting, bring him here and show us what he can see. God bless you. Let's give God praise, everybody. You believe Jesus lives? boy was just here is just an example. I just waited for a little bit. Of course, as long as he was standing this close and the anointing was on him, his eyes were bound to see. I've never asked for anything in my life lest it happen or something. Why? Now, I'm believing the little boy's sight will continue to come to him so that you can see we haven't, it's already supposed to close up here, I think, at 9.30 if we can, and we're way past due, and we thank everybody, their custodians and everything for letting us stay overtime and thing. and we've been overtime about every night. But here stands a bunch of penitent people standing at this altar. God bless you, my dear friends. Jesus Christ, be merciful to you. The same Jesus here, who knows all things, knows you and can do all things. Do you believe it? Then let us bow our heads while we worship Him. Ask Him, repent each one of you. Ask Him to forgive your sins. Ask Him to take you into His blessed presence. Now I want the ministers of the city to come forward and stand around these penitent people. The ministers of this city and other cities too, come here and stand around these penitent people like this while we pray. We want you to give them an invitation to your church. Whatever church you belong to, we want you to come here and tell them people you want them to come to your church. And do you know where they're at? And if they're in your district or somewhere, we want these people to have a church home. If they've never been baptized, we want you to baptize them with water. Because that's what they're supposed to be done. That's the gospel. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you, your children, to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's in Acts 2, 38, 39. All right, the commission is still good to whosoever will repent and be baptized. Your sins shall be forgiven. God said so. Now, I want each one of you, you minister brothers, if you want to walk out here, now let's bow our heads, everyone, while we pray for these people. You ministers, lay your hands over on them while they're standing there. Every person that's interested in lost souls, Heavenly Father, by the working of the Holy Spirit, tonight we have been here at a lengthy time. But, oh God, we got an eternity before us. And we're happy to know that these have come to take their stand and get their tickets as it was to pass over the sea one of these days. Tonight you spoke to their hearts and they've humbly walked out here, many of them, and standing around the altar, they're surrendering their life to Thee. Oh, God, who knows the secrets of the heart, You know what's in each one of them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that You will love them into Thy bosom. Grant it, Lord. We know that they could not have raised from their seat by their own power, for they have none. The body is totally dead without the Spirit. And the Spirit has made a decision at the calling of God, and they have come forward now to profess this decision that they've made. They have chose Jesus as their Savior. O Jehovah, Thou hast given them to Him. They are love gifts from you. 
and I as your servant present them to him by the fruits of this message in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray, eternal and blessed Father, that you will keep them in perfect peace. May no harm and danger come to them and every one that's standing here that's sick or crippled or afflicted. May it leave them at this time that they've confessed their sins and believed on Jesus who is present now. He has proved He is present by His great manifestation of His Spirit. And we ask now that you'll forgive them all their trespasses. Now I said in thy word, He that heareth my words and believe on Him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death to life. Amen. What a miracle! Dead sinners a few minutes ago awakened the Lord Jesus now before the world was ever formed. You predestinated them into eternal life and tonight they have come to accept it in the presence of the resurrected Jesus. Someday if you carry their bodies and no doubt go down here on the sod somewhere. But on that great notable day that we've looked for for 6,000 years, Jesus shall come and the dead in Christ shall rise. We shall be caught up together to meet them in the air. What a day that will be. May they say as David, moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope. For thou will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption, neither will he leave his soul in hell. Some glorious day, because Jesus raised, we shall too, and come forth in his likeness. Keep them in perfect peace with this faith. Lord, their dear old mothers and dads, many of them has passed over. Some of them has offered prayer. And if it be such a thing tonight, as they would have conscious of knowing, may they know that their wandering child has come home. Amen. Angels bear record of it. We know that the black flags of hell has been defeated tonight by the gospel and the white flags of heaven and the angels are rejoicing because sinners have come home. God's been made manifest. I give them to thee now for eternal life as thou hast promised. And thou hast said, He that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. Grant this blessing in Jesus' name. Now you at the altar here that's standing here, if you truly and humbly believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, accept Him as your personal Savior, turn right around towards the audience as a witness that you believe that Jesus is here and forgives every sin. Turn right around towards the audience. I want all the audience balcony all to raise your hands of fellowship that you welcome them into fellowship in the body of the Lord Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful time. Shake hands now in a minute as soon as the meeting's dismissed with these ministers. Get you a good church home and there abide until Jesus comes. Right now we're going to have the people to come shake hands with them just in a moment. Before that, I'm asking our good pastor, Brother Rasmussen, to come to the microphone here for the dismissing of the church at this time. God bless you.